Hey everybody! So today we have a really special guest. And I am overly excited that he has agreed to come upon the show and to share his knowledge. Today we have my good friend Amit. Now I'm sure everyone here knows about the famous company and great company in Mobi. And we have today one of the co-founders of Imobi, Amit, and a co-founder of his new company called Yulu Bytes. And he's here, he's here today to share with us his journey and the message that he has of hope and his whole, everything has gone along the way. So Amit, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. My pleasure. Let's start all the way from the beginning. Yeah. Before Imobi, before Yulu, before everything else, where are you from and what was your upbringing like? Yeah. So I spent uh, most of my childhood in India. And uh, before in Mobi, uh, I worked for some uh, startups. So if I go a little bit earlier, uh, you know, I, I went to an engineering college called IIT. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very famous actually in the US as well. Uh, so a lot of uh, big CEOs, uh, Google CEO, for example, is from IIT. And then bunch of valley uh, people uh, who are running big companies are from IIT. So I also happened to go there. And uh, after my engineering, I worked for three startups uh, with an intention of uh, running my own company one day. And uh, I'm talking about a time when running a company was not a norm. Mm -hmm. uh, not many com you know, not, not many individuals go and pursue this kind of journey. But somewhere in my head, uh, I think I, I had a dream, if not a plan, that I should be on my own. So that made me work for these startups rather than working for big companies. So take us back. What year are we talking about? 2000. So 2000, 2000. is the year when I graduated from uh, my engineering college. So this is before like the whole entire Indian startup ecosystem even started to start. It was even before I mean, the thought process of it. True, true. And so, 2000, if you remember, it was a year for more services companies. Mm -hmm. So Y2K, if you remember, right. that led to a lot of companies in the service domain, uh, you know, who were doing some work for U.S. customers. Infosys, Wipro, TCS, uh, they basically did a lot of such work. Right. And you are right, uh, there was nothing called startup back then. So let me ask you like this. Where did you get this crazy idea in your head? that you wanted to go on this crazy journey of starting a startup back in 2000, before even startups were even... <laughs> so, I would say that it may be you know, my own, uh, my, my family background, where uh, I was, uh, you know, probably only one in my three, four, five years generation who stepped out of family business and did something for others. So, call it, you know, it was in my, uh, in my roots. Uh, and I was very clear that uh, I should be on my own also. Not join the family business, but do something on my own. <laughs> so you have entrepreneurship in your DNA. So when, your yeah. when you told your father, hey, dad, I am not going to join the family business. I'm going to go on my own. What was his answer? So uh, it is actually a very interesting question. And, uh, you know, kind of my father was not happy. <laughs> to start with, uh, you know, after my college. I, I said, you know, I'm going to work for another company. And uh, he was clearly like that, you know, why will you waste your time? You know, you will earn more money by being in the family business. Uh, you come and, you know, uh, grow the business. And I will keep on asking for more time that, uh, you know, let me do work for one more year. I will learn and don't worry, I'll come. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, you know, with that, uh, I kind of uh, spent almost six years uh, giving one more year, one more year. And that never year never happened. <laughs> and then when I started uh, in 2006 early, and by the way, before Inmobi, I ran uh, another startup for a very brief period. And uh, it was actually, uh, again, not a norm. So everyone in the family and friends thought that something is wrong with me. You know, he must have lost the job or something has, something bad has happened. That's why he's, uh, you know, doing these crazy things. And uh, when I was leaving my uh, my professional job, 
uh, I I was married. I actually, by the way, got married pretty early ahead of a lot of my other friends. And I had a kid. And uh, my wife was not working. So everything was saying that something is not right with this guy. But I still did that. I thought, you know, uh, I am turning 30 and uh, let me pursue this. And uh, for a very long time, my, my father thought that, uh, you know, whatever I'm doing is, is not right. And uh, I'll, I'll go to my hometown or he will come visit me. I'll explain what I'm trying to do. But it's like, okay, you're doing something on mobile, uh, which people are using to speak. You are seeing some text will come. There will be an ad and uh, people will click on it. So he could not just relate to this whole concept. And uh, uh, for real, actually, he was very, very worried. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I'm sure now he's very, very happy. One more thing. One more thing. <laughs> Somebody also read that, you know, we guys have raised uh, some uh, VC money. And according to him, we have taken a loan. <laughs> that was loan. That, oh, you have raised like this crazy $15 million. <laughs> And uh, you know, what if you are not able to repay? <laughs> the concept of uh, venture capital investing was also not very clear and certainly not cool. <laughs> well, I, I definitely like your dad. He's definitely old school. The way to go about it. <laughs> well, well, I'm sure now, you know, when he, obviously not the loan part, but when he hears about the success of, of Immobi and, and Yulu eventually, I'm sure he's very happy right now. Sure yeah, but yeah, in the journey, I actually lost him. We lost uh-huh. him in the club. You know, when we started in Moby, a couple of years down the line, uh, we lost him uh, with some medical condition. That's right. uh, but yeah, I'm sure that he is very uh, proud. My, my, my mom is certainly happy. Right. She lives with me now. So, absolutely. Wow. wow. That's, that's really special. But, so, let's go back to you know, the beginning days of in Moby. Yeah. And we like to know, you know, before we get at the whole concept that you guys thought about mobile before anyone else thought about mobile, you know, we're talking about 2007 when like my, maybe the iPhone just came out then or didn't even come out yet. IPhone was not there. IPhone right. was not there. Android was not there. It was uh, very early days. Yeah. Right. So before we get into the whole concept, let's understand. Um, so you started the company, three other people. How did yeah. you bunch together? Where did the idea come from? And from there, we'll move forward. Yeah. So, uh, in movie, we had four co-founders, including myself, and three of us went to school together. And the fourth guy knew my other co-founder, Naveen, from Bay Area. So, it was a well-knit team uh, in that regard. And idea actually came uh, uh, when we started seeing, so India, as you know, you know, a lot of people around, uh, billion plus, even back then. And we started seeing mobile phones in the hands of common people. So just to set the context, these are the people who are, you know, blue collar people and uh, they will be made servant, they will be uh, drivers who are earning less than $300, right? And then we started seeing phones in their hands and there would be, I think, close to four to 500 million such people in India. So we thought that this device actually is going to be the lifeline for all of the Indians. And what if we create some business model on top of it? So we saw the mobile web, uh, mobile wave coming our, uh, our way. And uh, to be honest, in the beginning, we were not looking at mobile internet. Okay. We were looking at SMS uh, as a mode because uh, mobile internet was very, very small. Uh, but when we started uh, our business with SMS, we, we understood the, you know, the, the issues with SMS as a form factor. You cannot do targeting, you cannot do much, there's no rich interaction. And we kind of got to a stage where uh, we thought that, uh, you know, let's try mobile internet because that's closer to PC or desktop what Google has been doing. And we put it together a small team who in parallel created a platform. And whenever we get some uh, some ad, ad campaign from a customer, we say, okay, can we allocate 20% of the money to mobile internet? Mm-hmm. 
and we started seeing that that 20% money started giving 80% impact because that was much more measurable and we realized that you know sms probably is not the way to go so we killed it so thesis remains same that <clears throat> there will be mobile will be large phenomena and we can build a mobile uh, advertising business uh, and that is still true where uh, form factor has changed from sms to small little phones to an iphone in app everything so that's how we basically stuck on that and pursued it uh, for for a long time wow. <clears throat> so when you say you killed it um, from my understanding that's from when you started the original company it's called k k hash and then it, it trans it pivoted to in mobi yes m coach it's m called m coach m coach oh okay yeah, m coach <laughs> so, okay so let me take me back to that pivotal moment when you decided to kill that aspect of the business and focus full time on pivot what was what was the feeling in that period of time was it like you, did you feel like you guys are actually pivoting onto something bigger or you had a sense of failure that you know this didn't work out and then we have to figure something else what was going on about that period of time with with, with you and in general with that so so uh, the company's first avatar was uh, more into mobile search mm -hmm. as i said we were very inspired by google so we thought that uh, you know search would be good, would be big on on mobile as well so the name stands for m for mobile and coach is a hindi term for search mm -hmm. so that's how m coach name came into picture mm -hmm. and then we basically pursued it we realized that you know we are Uh, certainly not a search company. We we had a, and we can now use those terminology called display. So we were we could not build a search business out of it. We got into display advertising business model, and then uh, even after that pivot, which I am talking about, where SMS became mobile internet on on WAP and WML, we we were okay with this name, you know, because it was all India or, or Southeast Asia market. Whatever his name, no one cares. but uh, there was a stage in the company where we started growing up with business in europe and wherever we go they will basically use the same thing the way you said your name is h co and m coje and they will be like 10000 ways to spell our company's name and they were very confused that what the heck you know what you guys are up to and then we decided that uh, you know we are building a global company uh, why don't we actually change the name to a much Simpler name, which is uh, which can be accepted and understood by varieties of culture and countries, and that's where we basically looked around for options, and you know, like this name, which was short and sweet, and uh, it was uh, kind of bringing the essence of what we are trying to do. And when we did that, uh, this already started basically clocking up. So. because we already pivoted from a business model perspective the name change happened after 6 months so we saw the merit of doing it it was little bit emotional decision because we were like you know this is like our kid and we are calling it dan now from tomorrow we'll going to call him jack so you know that's not cool but uh, i think in the interest of uh, the larger goodness we said no problem you know let dan be jack and we are okay <laughs> it, it definitely worked out that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> so you guys literally predict you could predict the future I, i like to know what other predictions you guys made because i know you predict the mobile will become this whole massive thing and this whole um i don't love to know what other predict if you guys could predict the next 20 years i would want to be on your team <laughs> <laughs> so i think uh, probably that for us uh, because uh, we were living in india and india never seen any consumer electronics in a such a massive manner so if you look at the statistics our car ownership is very low our tv ownership is very low everything you can think of is low 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 but when it came to mobile we started seeing this device in the common man's hand right there we thought that you know Uh, this is probably going to be changing uh, everyone's life and hence uh, looks like this is a platform for the future mm -hmm. and uh, i don't think so we knew more than that i think uh, 
we we were just seeing and feeling that way and post that the big moment came when you know iphone uh, came into picture and luckily even google said that i'm going to do android and because of android this became a massive big business a global business otherwise you know iphone would have been maybe in the hands of 10% of the overall population but android actually gave this kind of computing platform to through the world including asia where you know uh, i'm sure that people could not have afforded iphone So take me back to the beginning days of Inmobi. What were some of the early challenges and hurdles that you faced? Yeah. So the biggest one now uh, I I don't want to trivialize the funding part. I think uh, I I must say that when we started there was no concept of uh, venture capital investing or very rare and that to angel invest investment uh unheard of and in fact we were the first company uh, which got funded by a group of angel investors who came together they said okay these guys look uh, interesting and crazy uh why don't we give them some money so we ended up raising like half a million dollar so that was actually certainly a big challenge back then but our our problem did not stop you know we were uh, changing business model from search to whatever but i think the biggest part was the people part where just like my father would be very depressed me doing this startup uh you know people who mattered whom we care for they like who are you you know uh, i i don't understand this part, part or point you know i understand i understand what is yahoo i understand what is this company i don't know what is mcoj or inmobi so attracting the quality talent back then uh, was not easy in fact people would come and say that hey uh, sorry i cannot work with you because i will not get married uh, and this was a challenge back then and uh, but we were lucky you know just like we got uh, blessings or we got some support from, from the angel investors we also basically got uh, some very good early members of the team who saw that you know they seem to be crazy guys and uh looks like they're up for something big uh so we basically then were able to build it but in the beginning it was not that easy right and post that you know you know that as happens in any startup when you pivot uh you would have burned a lot of the cash in the in a previous version of the business so it happened to us as well you know we had our near death experience in year 1 where we blew uh, all the half a million dollar uh, in the previous business model and then uh, we were like running on a wafer thin uh, bank balance uh, with our personal bank balances not uh, so healthy either uh, you know i was coming from another startup uh, navin was we had the education loan and also you know running two homes one in the us and one in india so it, it was actually a pretty crazy time Uh, but we somehow survived you know uh, and and came out of that wow what was your wife thinking uh, same you know <laughs> but i must say that uh, she she and my family has been very supportive of this journey throughout right. and um, all they believe that uh, you know we have we are passionate about this business and we will figure it out So I think this ups and downs are part of life. Yeah, so we had their support, yeah. Because some, some, you know, suddenly you're trimming down on your lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Uh, you need to have your support, uh, the support of the family. Right. And I think you know, not just we we undermine that aspect. You know, having the support of either a family, uh, close friends is most one of the most important things, especially as a founder or an entrepreneur. When the journey is lonely and the lows are very low. and the highs yeah. are very high but we want some you know when you have the highs all of a sudden you have a million friends a lot of new friends but when you have the lows you know that's when you, those people are the ones that matter the most yeah it's important for someone to have that and i think one of the amazing things about amobi i wanted to elaborate, elaborate about this is the fact you had four co-founders and you know yeah. how did you guys like you know rely upon each other i mean i'm not i'm not talking about the skill set in the sense that everyone complemented each other in their own skill set 
But in a sense, when it came to these hard times, these hard lows, you know, blowing through a half a million dollars, you know, almost losing the business in year one, how did you guys, how were you guys there for each other in an emotional aspect? Yeah. So I think that's where probably uh, we guys knowing each other and we were like really good buddies with each other, helped a lot. And, uh, uh, and I think people ask me what's the biggest thing in any startup. I, I would say that the trust among co-founders. And trust is one thing which there's no magic bullet. You have to build it. And if you know the person from the past, then it's easier. Um, otherwise, you know that toughness, you know, people will just uh, yell at each other. By the way, I think yelling each other is, is not bad. But not trusting each other is, is actually a uh, death of the startup. So in our case, uh, I think our previous chemistry and trusting each other was the key component, which kept us together. Uh, and not only, you know, four of us, but even uh, the, the core team, which we were able to create, they also became uh, just like us, where a uh, tough time came and they none of them left. Mm -hmm. So they would come and say, you know, just give me these many dollars. I need just this much of money uh, to just pay my rental or whatever. And, uh, you know, when time comes back, you pay me back. Wow. So we were very lucky, you know, the, the support of the co-founding team, the family and the core team, everything basically was integral part uh, in our time. Wow. That's such an amazing thing. So having co-founders that you could trust, you know, real co-founders, like yeah. relationship is incredible. Wow. I mean, there's so many questions we could go through, you know, about Imobi, about your journey. I mean, you guys were the first of many things. You know, you were the first unicorn in India, the first successful business in China, you know, outside business that was successful in China. Um, you guys, the first in mobile-wise, in the U.S., there's so many different things. And there are so many questions that I have specifically about it, but let's, let's, let's go through a few of them. When you look back at this whole entire process, this whole journey, so two questions. The first thing is, what do you find that were pivotal milestones that brought conviction that in Mobi it would be um, not necessarily success, but like would be here to stay? And, you know, the pivotal milestones. And the second question is, when you look back at this whole entire journey, how do you feel, you know? <clears throat> yeah. So uh, second question first. Okay, sure. Uh, Incredible journey. I think uh, nothing less than incredible, for sure. Uh, we, as you rightly said, we actually proved many myths wrong. Uh, that oh, no one can build a company from India for the world. How can you be successful in China? And uh, who does this startup? And like there will be tens of such things which people said cannot happen. And you know, we put India on the startup circuit. Uh, very, very proud of that. Now, as far as the movie is concerned, you know, we, we had several such milestones or moments. But I would say one of the big moments happened when SoftBank uh, came uh, and they invested $200 million in the company. And uh, uh, while that is not a, you know, parameter of a success, but at least it gave us a lot of confidence that uh, someone is willing to put uh, this serious amount of crazy funding and the person who is known to be knowing the future or at least have a point of view in the future uh, and be basically getting their support, uh, you know, Master San support, uh, that gave us a lot of confidence in whatever we were thinking and certainly a lot of for fuel to our, our execution engine. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the biggest one, I would say. Uh, and then there were so many of them, you know, when we went global from India to another country, uh, there are a bunch of them, as you can imagine. Right. But I think uh, in company's history, that was one of the big ones. Right. I mean, you know, getting an investment from, uh, from SoftBank, um, and I know before that you got an investment from Kleiner Perkins, but mainly from SoftBank, that's yeah. like really like solidifying saying, wow, I'm the biggest, you know, investment company in the world. Sure. So 
let's jump forward. You know, you left the Moby and I'm assuming, I don't know what it was, but you definitely got the entrepreneurial uh, uh, bug again and you decided that you wanted to go ahead and start another company. And I'm assuming you probably had a discussion with your wife and your wife was like, nah, you crazy. You're going to go through the journey again. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> you, you absolutely get it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, what's an entrepreneur, always an entrepreneur. You know, that, so yeah, I, what made you go through, decide to quit a Moby? You know, you had a successful company running. It's processing who knows how many millions of dollars that eventually, God willing, will go public on the IPO and the NASDAQ. But why go through the whole journey again? So... I'll, I'll tell you the answer, which is uh, interesting, and I, I think kind of deep also. So, uh, see, everyone, each one of us have their own uh, life goals, and uh, sometimes you know about them. Sometimes you discover that. In my case, I thought I'll retire at thirty, <laughs> and. Uh, when I really came to that milestone, I started talking, uh, thinking about it seriously. That okay, I had this wish or dream, whatever. <laughs> what? How are we going? How are we doing on this? <laughs> and then I was closer to that mark. I realized that you know, even if I am retired, what is that the goal uh, or this is an outcome? And after some introspection, I realized that, you know, probably that's not, is happiness for me. Happiness is something else. Mm. And uh, happiness is probably to give it back to society. And that's where, uh, you know, I it started thinking about uh, picking up a problem. So when we did in Mobi, in Mobi, Lens was more opportunistic. You know, nothing was broken in advertising. Uh, we saw the opportunity and we went after it. But uh, when I was looking at my second journey, I saw uh, the traffic congestion problem or air pollution problem in our country broken. That uh, you know it, it requires some solution. And I looked at some other social problems as well. So I looked at uh, the crisis of water, clean water, to be precise, which you know all of us gonna get hit big time and India will be certainly one of the countries uh, in that list and I also looked at uh, healthcare, education which are common you know problem in India but uh, you know after thinking that where I can actually put, put myself uh, where I can utilize my learnings and my network uh, which I have built so I ended up picking the traffic congestion and air pollution problem. And it was, as you rightly said, you know, once an entrepreneur, you're always an entrepreneur. Right. And sometimes you're an entrepreneur uh, supporting someone. You know, you can always be someone's advisor or help. And sometimes you operate. So I decided to be operating because I thought that problem is very, very big. And uh, it's it cannot be done by... Uh, Maybe they even the first time entrepreneur because the you have to deal with government, you have to deal with the society, you have to deal with policy making, uh, raise a lot of money, build a team again. So that's why I decided to pick it up. Wow. So you know, before I'm asking one question beforehand, how because you took it upon more of like obviously it's a business, but at the same time you look at it as like a, a social. Um, uh, I guess giving back, you know, building yeah. an issue that's a really a, a, a big issue in India, and you look at it like a, a mission, a purposeful mission, a social mission. Yeah. How important is it for a company to have a, a purposeful, um, I guess, mission or social mission built into their product or to the company itself? Yeah. So I would say it is not necessary. Okay. But I've seen that. Uh, if you are a purpose-driven company, then and if you are able to pull it off, then that company is uh, very valuable. Right. So uh, I'm 
also very clear that we are not creating an NGO. We are creating an enterprise, which is so big, so that it can fix this big problem. So uh, the way, and again, it's a little bit big difference, you know, big gap in, you know, let's talk about an Amazon or Google. So Google said, I want to organize all of the work in commission. Right. Uh, it was a big problem. Uh, solution happened to be the search engine. Same thing with us. Uh, we are saying that how can we solve for traffic congestion and pollution, which arises from traffic congestion. We probably don't know the right solution. You know, we are uh, we have started. We have got some success, but how this whole thing will look like after three, four, five years, we don't know. And that's uh, I think is a is an important one because uh, you should fall in love with the problem, not fall in love with the solution. Right. That's what you do when you are purposeful. Mm -hmm. And if you're opportunistic and opportunity driven. Your thinking and the way you will execute the business will be very different mm -hmm. because then you're just building to to sell or just building to quickly solve something and then move on. Right. Uh, but when you are behind a problem and behind a big problem, then uh, you know you have to keep on trying. It's right. like a you know it's a scientist who is saying that I want to solve a problem of a cancer. He does not know whether he will be able to do it in his life. Mm -hmm. But he's still basically inspired that, okay, I'm going to figure it out one, two, three, ten thousand times. And that's what actually, you know, uh, keeps you going. Uh, so uh, I may be biased right now, but I believe that uh, that problem uh, approach or orientation gives you a much longer shelf life yeah. as an entrepreneur. As a wow. So then let me ask you like this. You know, having this success with Imobi um, and then starting a new venture, so all the fears of starting a new company, you know, fear of failure, imposter syndrome, um, you know, how any other type of fear they could think of. Yeah. And after having the success, do those fears or all these thought process, do they go away? Do they go away in the next venture in Yulu or do you still have them? So... I would say I actually compare that with, uh, you know, you having a second baby. Okay. And, uh, you know, you know the doctor, you know the grind. Uh, you know this shit will happen, right? You, know, uh, you will run out of money, you will have these issues. But having said that, the challenges are challenges, you know, when something wrong happens, you have to go through that journey. And uh, that you cannot take it away. Having said that, uh, you know, I would say... One thing for sure, uh, I personally don't have a fear of failure. And the reason being, uh, uh, you know, we're not going after a small thing where someone will judge me that, oh, you could not do this kindergarten thing. I know that I'm going after a complicated beast. And in the journey, you know, and first of all, even if I'm failing, I know if I'm not giving it up, then the journey is not over yet. But the game is still on. And I, as long as I have that mental and, and maybe some, you know, some financial, you know, uh, fuel or, or oxygen, uh, then I'll at least try to pursue it for longer. And, uh, uh, and yes, you know, because of the success, there are, there are expectations on the team. So I should not uh, take that point away because ultimately a lot of people have given us a lot of money. Uh, Assuming that, you know, we will perform and uh, there's a, uh, if not legal responsibility, there's a moral responsibility right. for us to make sure that uh, we, you know, we give them some return. And uh, also when some successful senior entrepreneur fails, uh, I'm sure that there will be some people will get demotivated. Uh, although not a good thing, but yeah. People look up to success, uh, they will look up to failures as well. And uh, whatever is the case, you know, I'm sure that will certainly uh, be creating some learnings for our fellow entrepreneurs. Right. That, okay, we did this, we were successful, we did this. 
they could not make it work <laughs> but one thing for sure that we we will try multiple things uh, not going to give it up so uh, let's see well the the, the point <clears throat> see the point of this interview is to show how that you're human you're not a, you're not superman so people yeah. can understand if we all not <laughs> <laughs> sure. So, <clears throat> take me through one of you know in your entrepreneur journey. Walk me through one of those dark days. You know, it could be in Yulu, it could be in Mobi, but one of those dark dark days when you think the ship is going to sail and it's all going to go. That's it, it's done. Take me through a dark day and tell me what was that message of optimism, optimism and hope? And you, know, you just mentioned you're <clears throat> you're not afraid of failure, and I'm sure that kind of, that came over time. But you know, take us to a dark day and tell me what was the message of hope you're telling yourself in order to get yourself through. Yeah. So I think dark days or I would say tough days, they were related to uh, not having financial resources, enough financial resources. But uh, I know you actually your question is much deeper, but it's not related to the money part and. Uh, so for us dark days would be that uh, you knew that you are doing right things but there is some event uh, which is just not fundamentally right and for us you know issues get to people and uh, in early days actually we had we found out that hey you know one of the country lead uh has actually compromises professional integrity and we got to know that you know there's something wrong uh for us it was kind of you know we just trusted you and you know you've done this uh those were if kind of you know you are trying to do good things and then suddenly you are seeing that hey uh, someone is not uh, having the same professional ethics uh those were the tough times although it was just financial but you know it kind of pushed our own confidence in people little bit where you started suspecting everyone to that lens uh, so that was one thing other thing was related to culture you know where uh, there was a interesting incident where we started growing after soft bank funding we started growing in multiple countries and then now uh, while business was going because we are hiring more people putting more engineers in the job but then suddenly we realized that you know couple of our countries once again they are not exhibiting in movies culture and uh, we used to be like very puzzled you know everything is okay people are happy but this place does not look like a movie and uh, what is wrong and then after some introspection and some behavior observation we realized that so for example in mobi our india office there's no hierarchy there's in sitting everyone basically sits on a you know open seating arrangement there's no managers cabin there's no special queue for the food there's no special privilege so you fly you fly the same class as your peer you eat you stay in the same hotel there's no difference at all top to bottom but then we realized that you know what here there is a super boss and he is trying to act like a boss and uh, his cabin and blah and that was another you know kind of a dark day where we realized that oh my god you know we just because we never called out that in mobi has this culture code uh, and when we were growing uh, we just overlooked these aspects because we were just spend so many time you know all the time in moving around but never settle in an office for more than a week to even understand that something is wrong so that was another you know failure you can say which which we had but glad that we found and fixed it by having one of the co-founders go live there for like a couple of years and then fix it uh, from from the core from the foundation uh otherwise i think we have made wrong decisions on the product sometime sometime we pursued something longer which was not making sense sometime we killed uh, some product uh, prematurely which we regretted that we should have pursued it more 
but those are i think business as usual calls which where uh, the decision is uh, decision making is not very easy you know uh, it's just matter of luck of choice right wow yeah. powerful <laughs> it's always it's always great in retrospect to look back at all the lessons learned and give them all. it's incredible so who are some of the people that have made a difference in your life and people that you look up to yeah so in the context of uh, so there's a certainly a family you know my my parents my my wife uh, and some of my close friends they have uh, showed to me as an individual Uh, my own belief system my belief in goodness my belief in giving it back uh, those things happened because i was surrounded with those people but on a professional level uh, you know there are uh, two or three people who helped me in my own quest of that what do i mean by when i say i want to be retired or you know what is left in my life book and Uh, not in that order but uh, you know three people who uh, really helped me in even understanding that i can make a difference in this manner uh, so you probably might be knowing the chairman of wipro his name is ajim premji yeah so he he owns uh, wipro uh, company second person is uh, infosys co-founder called nandan ilkani who actually went after uh, after you know infosys he did a big project for the country where we got everyone got an id called aadhaar in india so not only he basically did that but also is a big philanthropist you know he has been pledging uh, a lot of his his wealth to for social cause and last but not the least uh, you know even bill and melinda gates where uh, bill actually left every thing operationally from microsoft and you know his journey now you know he's spending almost all of his time in traveling to different countries running uh, very very big projects even you know taking away the polio and uh, and i would actually meet all three of them every year uh and uh, you know they they basically assemble a group of people to talk about philanthropy and in the beginning i used to think that you know all of you guys have hundreds of millions of dollars to give away uh where i am fitting you know and uh, my stock in in mobi uh, even if they are worth hundreds of millions but we still need to do an ipo you know <laughs> where do i have money and uh, for how long i should be waiting and well, then you can't wait you want to give them away i'm av- i'm available <laughs> uh, at the same time you know i thought and i then started meeting more people who were like they were not like bill gate uh, they were not like nanan they 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 had something in them and they were using that core strength to make a difference and it took me some time to realize and understand that maybe uh, entrepreneurship itself is a way to give it back right. and only thing is you know you need to pick a problem uh to to solve for them. and that's how you know these mm-hmm. individuals uh who directly and indirectly shaped my own they actually gave me clarity about what i really want to do right. for next 10 years of my life mm-hmm. and uh, and that was very fascinating uh this story for me and otherwise i am big fan of elon musk i think he is the uh, one of the finest living legends uh can think big think impossible things and has ability to execute so i'm very very big fan um unfortunately i have not met him i have not spent not time with him. not yet so hopefully i'll meet him and 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 get to learn more but i'm a big fan of him wow that's powerful it's incredible and i want to touch upon that you know aspect of social mission and being socially driven you know we think that 
you know, like you mentioned also previously that, you know, why am, you have all these people that have millions and billions of dollars to give away. You know, who am I? I don't have that yet. What am I doing? And being socially driven and how, on a social mission, every single person, no matter where he's holding financially or where he's holding in any other aspect of his life, has the ability to affect someone else. Yes. Right? So you and me, you know, is our... 100,000 people going to watch it? Probably not. And are 1,000 people going to watch it? And a few thousand? Yeah. But, you know, our goal is not that 1,000 people. Our goal is that, that one person sitting in a small little village in India or sitting in a small little village in, in Indonesia or in New York to affect their life and make a difference in their personal life. And, and I, like it's famous saying, you know, the ben the, when two people meet, it's always to benefit a third person and to make a difference in someone else. So socially driven is not just, you know, with money-wise, but it could be with connecting with someone emotionally, giving a smile, giving a hug, a high five. You know, that's where being the different, making the difference in someone else's life could do. You know? True. So I know you're pressed for time, so let's fire off a few quick questions. Um, so what are the books that you recommend to other people to, to read? Now, I see in the corner of your office you have the book Principles. <laughs> Incredible book. Ray Dalio. Phenomenal book. <laughs> But uh, of them, you know, uh, I, I, I read a lot of books on leadership and entrepreneurship. Uh, these are the two of my favorite uh, you know, topics. And, uh, and you literally hear the same names, uh, Hard Things About Hard Things, Zero to One. And uh, there's some interesting book on even thinking and strategy. So this is how basically I, I, I kind of learn. And, what, what can I do? Wow. It's incredible. And I tell you, if, I'm not sure if you finished it, you have read it yet. I highly recommend you to read Principles. Phenomenal book. Incredible. Principles, Principles by Ray Dalio in the corner of your office. Okay. Yeah. You have it actually over there. I see it. Yes. It has been gifted and I have to read it. It's a phenomenal book. Really incredible. Uh -huh. And it puts a lot of what you said into real context in the sense of living a life based upon a set of principles and values. Phenomenal. Yeah. So, when you take a step back and, you know, you look back at your journey. Now, we're not talking about reincarnation or, you know, being reborn again. But what message, like, do you tell a younger Amit that's facing life again, that's graduating from IIT, that's not started, that has not started in Mobi yet, has not started in Yulu, and is looking at his life journey and thinking, what am I going to do with my life now? What message do you impart to him? Yeah. So, it's a tough one. And I don't even have, even if I give this message, uh, it can help or not. But somewhere knowing uh, your life goals, uh, I think that is important. And you're doing something about it. It took me a good 40 years. I'm not saying that, you know, what I did in the past was not helpful. But uh, so when we were doing it, Mobi, we had this dream of building some uh, big startup from India. That was the you know, notion of success or that was the dream. Mm -hmm. That got changed. And if I step back, uh, I still think that uh, you knowing what really you want. So there's your definition of success or really want to do. Right. That does not come very naturally. You know, people don't know. And I love uh, you know Steve Jobs' uh, statement on that. He always says that love what you love doing, uh, do what you love doing, right? And uh, it actually is the same thing, where you know that this is what you're good at, or this is what you enjoy, and if you can make that a career out of that, nothing like that. Right. And I'm seeing a lot of my friends who uh, you know became engineer by accident and in India it's a little bit different uh, education system everyone is forced to become an engineer or a doctor so even if you are a great artist or a singer uh, you probably will not have uh, an opportunity to make a great living all the things have changed over the last 20 years but you know a typical middle class family uh, who is just uh, doing that much financially they will never have those dreams mm -hmm. So now our country has also changed uh, for good. But now I'm realizing a lot of my batchmates, 
they someone has become a movie director someone has become a painter someone has become a you know dancer and whatever and uh, when you meet them you f- you actually can feel that how happy they are right you know what they were doing some corporate job 9 to 5 uh, just for living and really not excited about their life but now they're full of life right so truly and i don't want to take away the fact that you know your your bank balance and everything has to uh, be good enough for you to be doing this uh, but when i was a kid uh, certainly uh, the set up family set up everything uh, they were not that favorable for sure right wow powerful so but you know that's the whole but you know to a certain degree that's like the whole struggle of life um, finding your mission finding your goals But at the yeah. same time, that's the best thing possible. You have to know who you are, your weaknesses, your strengths, and yeah. really sit down and go through that and figure out who you are because then the whole journey will be easier. Sure. So, I mean, it goes without saying. You know, if there's anything I can do for your family, for Inmobi, for Yulu, I'm sure Inmobi is great by now, but if anything I can do, always here, and you have an open invitation to New York, always ready to welcome to roll out the red carpet. <clears throat> Thank you sir thank you this It's has been uh, absolutely you. phenomenal <laughs> i have yeah. learned a tremendous amount um i'm ready to continue talking for hours and to ask you a bunch more questions and learn so much more from your journey because we haven't even done anything yet touched on any type of surface because you have so much knowledge and so much to give and share from your experience that we forget about the fact that we talk for hours but i could just walk away feeling educated motivated inspired and powerful to just like, conquer the world you know from it uh, appreciate and I'm, i i can imagine that uh, you must be talking to a lot of fellow entrepreneurs like myself how excited and motivated you are yeah <laughs> very very good and and i appreciate the fact that uh, the work you are doing is also helping the world in in a sense right ultimately uh, you are creating more entrepreneurs who will solve more problems and what will be better yes so I think this is totally important job which you guys are doing. Thank you so much.